Okay, let's go ahead and get started with our webinar, your 10-step guide to using online communities, where we'll help you understand the key steps that will help you design and use your online community in an optimal way. Today, we have Ray Pointer with us. Ray is founder of The Future Place and New MR. He's author of countless titles, but some of the most notable are The Handbook of Online and Social Media Research, The Handbook of Mobile Market Research, and editor of SMR's book, Answers to Contemporary Market Research Questions. He's also a, cor a course author for the University of Georgia's Principles of Marketing Research Online course. I've taken that, it's a fantastic course. And he's also the founder of newmr.org. Ray has spent the last 40 years at the interface of research, technology, and insights, and is in wide demand as a consultant, trainer, workshop leader, and keynote speaker. We're excited to have him here today. Myself, I have over 15 years of market research experience, and I'm really passionate about the role that software plays in helping businesses. I believe that software can help companies get better feedback, uncover actionable insights, and ultimately develop better products and services. So today, um, we'll talk about some of the things that have made online communities the fastest growing trend uh, over the last 10 years uh, among new research techniques. And then in order to get maximum value from your community, you need to ensure that you have good design and utilize your community in the right way. And here, we're gonna be presenting the 10 steps that can help you achieve that. Today, please share content and tweet questions using hashtag QP Online Communities on Twitter. We'll be monitoring this during the webinar and answering this in real time. And then Ray at the end will also be doing a, a Q&A. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. You will receive a copy of this webinar um, after it's done and it'll be sent to your inbox. And also we'll direct you to where you can download an ebook that Ray and I will talk more about coming up here. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Ray. Hi, Ray Pointer here. And I'm going to take you through a 10-step guide to using online communities. So here are the 10 steps, but you don't need to focus on them too much because I'm going to go through each one of them one at a time. But also because Dan and I have created a book for you, an ebook, which you can download, which has got all 10 of these steps, plus quite a lot of information around them to help you make sure that you optimize online communities for your projects and for your organization. So let's go through these 10 steps. The first is that you need to identify a community of interest. The word online community really focuses on this word community. So the most typical way of creating an online community and creating a community of interest is to work with customers. Your customers and you have a common interest in improving the services that you offer and that they receive. Whether those are products or whether they're services, they want you to improve your offering, you want you to improve your offering, so we have this community of interest, we're going to work together. And so the starting point for many online communities is to work with customers. Now, sometimes that's not possible. Maybe you are a spirits brand and you have lots of different types of vodka and whiskey and gin and these sorts of products. And you need to talk to your customers, prospective customers about these different products. Or you're a soft drink manufacturer and you have many sorts of products. Or you're a consumer packaged goods company and you have lots of different brands within that. What you then have to do is identify something that creates a community of interest. So I have seen uh, pharmaceutical brands work with wellness, for example. I have seen lots and lots of food ingredient companies uh, working with the concept of the kitchen or cooking or cooking for the family. I've seen some great communities working with things like the Spirits Lounge or the Speakeasy Bar, places where you would go and you would talk about different alcoholic beverages. So 
try to make sure that you find that community of interest. Shared interest, shared benefits. And you're going to do that at the recruitment stage. You're going to do it at the design stage. You're going to try to ensure that you do it all the way through the lifespan of the online community. You've got to make sure that you have that community of interest. One of the ways that you're going to ensure that is you're going to show the members of your online community that they have been listened to and you're going to identify the benefits and you're going to let them take the credit to some extent for those benefits. We listened to you, you said this, we have done this, thank you very much. That is what we mean by a community of interest. And you've really got to maintain that interest over time. One of the things that we see go wrong with many communities is that they're recruited, they start really well, and the tasks are repetitive and they're boring and they're focused on what the company wants rather than thinking about what do the members and the company or the organization want together. So even if you have quite a few tasks which are perhaps a little bit tedious, make sure that you mix them up with some things which are more fun, they're more entertaining, they're more balanced so that we have that community of interest. Members of the community should be able to understand why they're doing this task. When you ask them to collect photographs of something, or when you ask them to take part in a discussion, or when you ask them to take part in a survey, it should be clear to them what the benefit to you is, and therefore what the benefit to them will be as things go forward. So community of interest is the first step, and it's the most important step. Now we have a design issue about whether or not we're going to use short-term communities or long-term communities. A short-term community could be three days, it's probably going to be a week to three weeks, it could be three months. Um, but it means that there is a clear endpoint. Now when we have a short-term community, it's normally tackling a single research problem. Long-term communities tackle multiple problems, but a short-term community tends to be an alternative to doing a survey, an alternative to doing a series of focus groups, an alternative to doing ethnography projects. It is an approach to solving a research problem. Now, we can use a mixture of, of surveys and qual or whatever, but it's going to be short term, which means the number of members of the community will typically be smaller because the cost of recruiting them could be prohibitive. So it might be 100, it might be 300, it might be 500. It might be 30 if you're doing something that's really focusing on a more ethnographic approach. It's going to be harder to develop an ongoing community because people are unlikely to see the results of their work being turned into changes in the products and services. So it's more likely that you will have to pay a higher set of incentives when you're working with a short-term project than with a long-term project. Now what do I mean by long-term? I mean things that are sort of indefinite. So usually these are commissioned one year at a time, but I've worked with many communities which are now more than 10 years old. Obviously they've got additional members over the years and there's been changes and there have been changes in how that community has been structured, but they're in there for the long term. And this is a commitment from the brand to co-create the future with customers. A short term project, you still find that community of interest, there is the, the commitment to crowdsource and to co-create. But in the long term, you're really being customer centric. You're saying we're going to put customers at the center of what we do. We're going to research more things in more ways than we would otherwise do. Now, the long term community can be small if it's mostly qualitative. It can be 100, 200, 300 people, or it can be 5,000, 20,000. Some of the communities I'm working with now have got more than 100,000 people. So it can be quite variable depending on how we're going to use it. You are going to need to think about things like newsletters, about um, how we're going to phase the recruitment. All of these issues come into play with long term. With long term you need software that's going to help you manage things in the long term. In the short term you want something that's going to deliver something nice and punchy and meet your short term requirements. 
Now there are three ways we can think about our communities. The first of them is, is it mostly going to be qualitative? If it is, you want a platform that provides you with discussions, with chat, with the ability to do ethnography projects, um, how are you going to use projection techniques in your qualitative, how can we create discourses um, through text, through telephone, through face-to-face, -face, a wide variety of things. The size of your community is going to be smaller if all you're going to be doing is qualitative research. If you recruit a thousand people, you can't talk to all of them qualitatively at the moment, maybe in the near future with AI and chatbots, but at the moment you're going to be using people. So you would recruit people to the community and you wouldn't really be talking to them all. And that is quite bad for keeping that community of interest and engagement. So you will typically recruit fewer people if it's going to be qualitative only. Short term, you might be talking about 30, 100 people. Long term, 100, 200, 400 people are typical sorts of numbers. Another type of community is going to focus on quantitative research. So that is mostly surveys. There are other things going on, but surveys are the, are the bread and butter of the quantitative community. What are you going to need? You're going to need automation because you're going to want to make sure that you're drawing your sample, you're sending the surveys to the right people, um, that it's being processed. You are probably going to want to look at data integration. You're going to want to look at text analytics. And can you do analysis in the platform or do you have to move that software out to somewhere else to be able to see what's going on? At the very least, you need to have dashboards and top line analysis tools in the platform to make sure that you're going to get the maximum benefit from your quantitative online community. But perhaps the most common thing that's happening going forward is that we're combining qualitative and quantitative in the same online community, particularly in a long term community. If you're going to have this community running for years, then you probably want the choice to be able to take off 10 of them for an ethnographic project or interview a thousand of them about this new survey or this new product testing idea. So you're going to want the qualitative tools, you're going to want the quantitative tools and you're also going to want some future proofing. So is it a platform that is looking at the new text analytics, the new chatbots, the new automated systems that are coming in because you're going to want to make sure that you're comfortable with combining all of these techniques together. So we've thought about our community, we've decided that it's going to be based around customers or it's going to be based around this other community of interest. We've decided it's going to be long term or short term and what the focus is in terms of qual and quan. Now we need to recruit it. The best way to recruit an online community is from a customer list. Um, if you only deal with your customers digitally, then all of your customers are online. And this is true for many airlines now, and for many other services. So you have those sorts of lists, you know who you want to recruit. You want to make sure that you get the right balance. You want fans of the brand. You want people who are going to be critical of the brand. You want people who are heavy users, people who are light users. Um, you probably want a mixture of single people and couples and families. You want a mixture of older and younger. Um, if you're talking about something like travel, you want people who do short distance travel and long distance travel. So you think about the right mixture and then you go to the, your, the sources to recruit that. So if you've got customer lists, that's your starting point. If you don't have customer lists, it is going to be harder. So maybe you'll need to advertise for them. Maybe you'll need to buy them from a list, a list broker. One of the downsides about buying people in from list brokers is you will tend to get more people who are thinking about incentives and fewer people who are really interested in co-creating the future for your brand. So you have to work with what is possible. And the starting point is 
customer list is best failing that some form of active recruitment such as advertising along with your products if you're a magazine if you're a TV channel you can use your own platform to do that and then probably the last choice is purchase sample one of the most important things with long-term communities is the ongoing recruitment the worst thing you can do is recruit a community let's say 5,000 people you run it for about a year and a half and you notice that you're down to 4,000 people and you're really short of young men so what you do is you recruit another 800 people and you maybe 400 of those are going to be young men and all of the data that you're working with suddenly takes a jump because you've got a lot of new people and new people respond slightly differently to people who've been in the community for a while you've now got a different balance within that so that is going to cause changes by far and away the best way to do your ongoing recruitment is monthly or quarterly you look at who you've got you look at who is replying maybe you've got plenty of professional men in your community but they're not replying very often so actually you need more professional men because the key issue is not who is in your community but who is replying to the various activities who is taking part in the various activities you're conducting and then add new data so many every month or so many every three months every quarter but ideally it'll never be less frequently than quarterly so that things are coming in in a steady way you can greet all of those new people when they come in you can make sure that their responses actually make sense if somebody really doesn't get the idea of being in the online community you can drop them out you can also look at whether people have become inactive because you may have a community of 5,000 people but if you've got a thousand people who have not responded in the last year well it's better to remove them from the community but first give them the chance to say oh I've not responded because I've changed my email address and I don't look at that one very much and if you do this I could become more active so all of that is part of this ongoing recruitment process when we first started doing communities and I started nearly 20 years ago doing online communities we had the idea that they would be self perpetuating you would create a forum and your customers would come together and they would drive the discussion process that almost never happens if people want to talk about stuff they will do it on WhatsApp or Instagram or Facebook or one of these platforms where their friends are if we want them to talk about butter and margarine or if we want them to talk about frequent flyer programs then we need to create the conversation and ideally that should come from the brand people join an online community because they want to talk to the brand they don't want to talk to each other and they don't particularly want to talk to market researchers so if I join a community for one of the major airlines I want to talk to that airline it's because I fly on that airline and I want them to improve the seats in coach or I want to improve the check-in process so what will tend to happen is that we'll get a question from the brand about a topic some people will reply to that conversation the moderator should immediately be going back in and probing which reinforces to people they're being listened to it means that the conversation will move forward you will get some members of the community answering other members points and conversations but not many not nearly as many as you will get if you ask the questions and then you probe and you thank and you keep moving that conversation forward so don't imagine that discussions will just happen you will need to make them happen by being proactive in the process we all need rewards for doing things they don't have to be extrinsic rewards sometimes they do and the most common form of extrinsic reward is cash extrinsic rewards are things that have a value that can be given to other people so if I give you cash 
you can spend it. If I give you credit cards, you can spend it. If I give you prizes like kettles and washing machines um, and flights, they have a real cash value. So we call those extrinsic rewards. If you want a lot of somebody's time, like you want them to take a photograph of every meal they eat for a week and to write some commentary around it, you are going to need to give them extrinsic rewards as part of that process. If you've got a large long-term community, you are probably going to use a prize draw reward because we have two types of extrinsic two types of extrinsic rewards paper play and prize draw. Paper play is expensive. If you've got a qualitative community, you've only got 30 people active per project, it is not too expensive. On the other hand, if you've got 100,000 people in the community, you've got 2,000 people taking the survey, if you're paying them $2, that's $4,000 pounds, $4,000 um, coming out straight away. So very quickly, there is a disincentive to keep the community very active. So what tends to happen in most long-term communities is you get points during the month and those then enter into a prize draw. So the expenditure for running the community is fixed. The downside of extrinsic rewards is you can very easily get a, you get what you pay for mentality. So the brand and the researcher thinks they can do things because I'm paying people to do it. So surely they will do this boring survey. And on the flip side, if people are only doing surveys and discussions to earn the money, they are likely to do it as cheaply and as inexpensively and are not really going to focus on the accuracy. So whilst extrinsic rewards are sometimes necessary and often probably fair, they should only be part of the process. What we really want are intrinsic rewards. And some of the best communities I've ever seen are those which have not been allowed, sometimes by law, to offer an extrinsic reward. If you can't pay people to take part, you have to try much harder to want to get people to want to take part. So intrinsic rewards are all about giving people an emotional reward for being part of the community. It starts with saying thank you. It can include giving them feedback on the results of research. It can include having leaderboards for the people who have made the best contributions. Some of the communities I've seen have created juries and citizen panels and they've then ended up being reported in the house magazines or in public magazines saying this was from our community. Here is Sue from Philadelphia who helped create this new design telling people every time you create a new product or service it is going to be launched so tell them um, Thursday next week we're going to be advertising the new beer that you help test um, have a look at it and tell your friends that you help create this all of that will generate more intrinsic rewards even if you're paying people to take part you should still be really thinking about boosting the intrinsic rewards it's the intrinsic rewards that improve the quality, that improve the commitment, that allow much better community of interest. So really be thinking about what can we do to say thank you, to really make people feel valued within the process. You have to balance work and life, work and fun. So don't send all surveys about satisfaction with products. Um, satisfaction with new details. You really want to put in some stuff that's fun. Now, fun varies. So one type of fun is having a fun survey. So what's, how green are you? Um, how outgoing are you? Those sorts of things that you see in magazines and you see on the internet are great to put into your community as something to, to make it more fun. But you can also have things which are about your genuine research needs which are also fun. If you've never done a video upload project where people have to talk about their emotional response to something then that actually is fun. Getting them to do photographs and upload them and then displaying that back as a collage of all the different ideas that people have suggested 
that can also be fun. Um, the whole gamification of research ideas is about making research more fun. So let's not make the research tedious ever and sometimes let's make it really fun so that people will look at this, they'll get involved and that they will want to do the next exercise. The single most important person in the success of an online community is the community manager. Now when we first started with online communities we kind of thought that these were going to be to do with the market researchers and some market researchers make great community managers but you don't have to be a market researcher to be a great community manager. You need to be genuinely interested in people. You need to be comfortable with the digital social medium that you're going to be talking to people in a way that makes sense that you're going to be good with tools like writing newsletters like probing and saying well done is there anything else you can tell us about that that's a fantastic comment I want to hear more about that do you, any, do you know anybody who had a different experience to you those sorts of questions going in there looking at what the researcher and the client wants to do and saying hold on that is just too boring for my community members. I need you to lighten up. Maybe I need you to break it into three separate pieces. Or we need to do something to make that more fun. So the community manager defends the members against the organization. They advance the case for the organization with the members and they turn it into a really productive thing. They grow the community into something that starts as quite useful but becomes invaluable over time. So really value the community members and look to recruit them from outside market research, outside insights, people who have moderated groups, people who are very active in Reddit or something like this, people who are good at writing, people who are good at communicating. Those are the sorts of people you want to be your community managers. Now, I'm going to pull together some ideas in this final tip for the sorts of projects and research tools you might want to be using. So, think about using MaxDiff. MaxDiff is really straightforward to program and to interpret, but it's a nicer way of doing things. So, let's say we have got 20 different things we could prior, uh, prioritize in the supermarket. We could say to people, imagine you were talking to the manager. I'm going to show you four items at a time. Which one do you think he or she should spend time on improving? And which one do you think is the least important for him or her to spend time on improving? Or we can look at a customer satisfaction and say, OK, you've been looking at this series of television programs. Here are four characters. Which would you like to see? in the next um, series and which would you least like to see in the next series. So there are lots of different ways we can use MaxDiff and it's so much better than getting people to use scales, um, satisfaction, agree, disagree. You get better data and it's more fun for the people taking part in those surveys. So think about using more MaxDiff. If you want to have a discussion, think about using WhatsApp or if you're not in the US, if you're in China, you might want to think about using WeChat. If you're in Japan, you might want to use Line. There are lots and lots of different messenger applications. So maybe you recruit people from your community and you say, how many of you are using WhatsApp? Let's have a discussion about this. People can share photographs and it's just a bit more lively and a bit more connected. Great type of project is the day in the life of. Asking people to do too much ethnographic stuff is hard work. People tend to drop out after a few days. Um, you may need to pay quite a lot, but a day in the life of is much more straightforward. So ask people to collect information about everything they wore that day. Photograph of it, why did they choose it, how do they put it on? Or a photograph of every piece of machinery you use today at work, if it's a B2B study or everything you drank today and so get different people to do it on different days of the week perhaps seven different days of the week split up your community gather this day in the life of and you'll end up with a really rich set of data 
this is great for pathways to purchase, pathways to all sorts of things, collecting that sort of information together. It really brings it to life. Fun quizzes. How modern are you? How green are you? How addicted to social media are you? You can find an enormous number of these on the internet. Go out there, collect them, use those as a way to make the community um, more lively, more interesting, and so on. And also, if you're, you have a long-term community, a great way of selling it into the stakeholders is the omnibus study. So, depending on the size of your community, once a week or once a month, collect all of those individual questions from around the company and send those out as an omnibus. Um, so you may have one, if you are um, an airline, you may have one question you need to ask people about, did you see our advertising this week? You may have one question about what sort of soft drinks would you like to be able to drink on the plane? You may have another question about um, what is um, your main gripe with the toilets. You may have another question about which airport is your favourite airport. You can bring these four, five, six questions together, send them out as a single survey. Because it's an online community, we don't have to ask the demographics and all of that question. We already know it. So we've got these four or five questions. We gather that data and we can send it back to the different departments. And that helps embed the value of your community around your organisation. So here are the 10 steps that we're talking about. Identify a community of interest. If you don't do that, it's just a panel. You're simply paying people to do survey research and you will get half-hearted um, cooperation. You really won't get the same quality that you'll get if you're going to create a community of interest and maintain a community of interest. Think about whether it's going to be short term or long term. And this has got some quite significant differences in terms of how you fit it into your organization. A short term community is normally there to tackle a specific research problem. It's very easy to define its success or not because there's a project, there's a budget and there are outcomes. Long-term communities are about tackling multiple problems over time. They're about changing the nature of the relationship between you and your customers. So you need more thinking about how we're going to make sure that there is enough work to keep the community busy. Who is going to be funding the community um, over a period of time? Then we're going to think about qualitative, quantitative, or a mixture of both. If it's a short-term community, it makes sense for it to be just qualitative or just quantitative. It can make sense for a long-term community to be just qualitative, but normally you will find if it's a long-term community, you want to do a mixture of qual and quant. Think about how you're going to recruit your community. Is it going to be from a customer list? If not, how are you going to set about doing it? You're going to think about discussions don't just happen. How are we going to engage people to make sure that they are feeling like they're talking to the brand? The most important thing is that they feel like they're talking to the brand. We're going to balance intrinsic and extrinsic reward. The extrinsic rewards are cash or points or something like that. But the most important thing, coming back to that identifying community of interest, are the intrinsic rewards. People have got to feel good about being a member of this community. If you really want it to deliver value, they have to feel good. And that means balancing the work and fun. You can't send out boring stuff and some of the stuff you send out, you send out to people to do has to be positively fun. We want to use behavioral economics to promote engagement. So different techniques that will make people look at things and say, yes, that makes me want to take part. I am getting recognized. I'm getting a feeling that what is working here, I would lose something if I were no longer a member of this community. The most important person is the community manager. Think about who the community manager is going to be 
give them the resources, the time and the training and the support to make sure that they can really create this community of interest, they can maintain the engagement, they can make it fun, that they are delivering great value. And then have a list of projects that you might want to run. Have a look at the published literature. Have a look at webinars from other people about the sorts of projects and ideas they've done. Now, if you want to learn more about what I've just been talking about, the 10 steps, have a look at our book uh, from Dan and myself, The Hacker's Guide to Using Online Communities, The 10 Step Guide to Using Online Communities. And you'll find all sorts of ideas and more depth about the sort of things that I've just been talking about. So, thank you very much, and I look forward to questions. So we have a question here about how important is it to use the best technology? Well, it's lovely to use the best technology. It's certainly not the most important issue. Um, when I look at some really great communities, some of them are using tech that isn't the best because the most important thing is they've created the community of interest. They've got the right community manager. Um, they're making things fun and they're really linking into value for the company. So yes, you want nice tech, but it certainly isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is to get your design right. Okay, we have a question here. Um, can I have a community that mixes customers and non-customers? It's not easy um, because we want a community of interest. So let's imagine that we have two banks, Bank A, Bank B. If we want to have a community to improve the services that Bank A offers, it's very straightforward to see why customers of Bank A should want to join that community and help improve the service they receive. Why should customers of Bank B want to spend time and effort improving Bank A? Pretty much the only reason they would do it is for money. Um, and that is not a great way of creating a community of interest. So if you really do want to look at customers and non-customers, you probably need to think about a community of interest that is different from just the brand. So a community of interest about banking. But of course, you're going to get slightly quirky people if all you've recruited are the people who are really interested in the banking sector. So when we're talking about cooking, when we're talking about holidays, when we're talking about travel, when we're talking about sport, having a community of interest based on the topic is relatively straightforward. If we're talking about insurance companies, if we're talking about banks, um, if we're talking about those sorts of things, it's much harder to get a community of interest going. So it's much harder to have non-customers. I would probably say have a community of customers and then use online panel companies or something like that to research non-customers. We've got an interesting question here. In an online community, isn't it just brand fans? Isn't, aren't everybody going to be really happy about what you're doing? Certainly not. Um, so first of all, you want to recruit people across the whole range, from people who are fans of your brand through people who are quite critical of your brand, but are customers. So you don't want people who are critical of your brand and never use it and never will use it because there is no scope for you to improve the brand for those people. But even the people you recruit who are fans for your brand when you recruit them will not like everything that you do. Um, and one of the phrases that we sometimes hear, hear being used about online communities is that they should be critical friends. The sort of friends that when you say, do I look good in this dress or do I look good in this suit? will say no if you don't look good in this suit and will say yes if you do look good. Um, and that is what we're looking for from the community. There is one group of people that you tend not to be in the community. So we find that there are fans, we find that there are critical friends, we find that there are people who are really quite unhappy with the brand. 
but you don't find many people who have no opinion, who really don't care about you very much, even though they're customers. You're under going to underrepresent those people and you will with any form of research. They're the people least likely to take part because really they don't care very much. So that is, is one of the sectors that will come through in that. Um, question here, should I start with a nice big incentive for the first few projects to make sure we start um, with a really good response rate? No. Um, one of the ways of killing response rates is if the level of rewards drop. So start off with where you need them to be. Um, really think about the intrinsic rewards, how to make people feel good. And one of the clever things that uh, people have done to use the behavioral economics to make the engagement higher is every so often give people a spot prize. So, um, Jim from Austin has got a hundred dollar bonus this month. Um, no reason, he was just a lucky winner. And so, people love those sort of responses where they come through and you get the, the surprise additional benefit. So, that is a good way of doing that. And then there's a question here about what should your response rate be. Now, this will vary depending on your topic. If you are talking about chocolate to people who love chocolate, the response rates will tend to be higher than if you're talking about insurance policies, even to people who are interested in insurance policies. So the topic itself has some difference. But really, you should be thinking about a response rate from your online community of more than 50% of the people you send the invitation to. I word it that way because if you're trying to do, um, you've got a community of people who fly with your airline and you want to do a survey about flying intercontinentally. If you send that invitation to everybody, many people are not going to respond because they don't fly intercontinentally. So provided we send the invitation to the right subgroup of people, we want to see a response rate of more than 50%. That is achievable. Most of the communities that I have worked with over the years, if we've got the community right, if we've removed the people who don't want to be in the community, if we are targeting the invitations correctly, if we've got all of the intrinsic rewards sorted out, we're giving people lots of feedback, we're giving them the right number of tasks, which is somewhere between one and four a month, then we will get response rates over 50%. If you're getting a 5% response rate, you need to radically rethink your community, your engagement, and your design. Great, thank you, Ray. That was filled with a lot of excellent information. Appreciate you presenting on the webinar today. As Ray mentioned, the ebook is available. So go to questionpro.com slash ebook to download your copy. And that's what it looks like. That's the cover. And as Ray mentioned, we cover more in depthly the 10, the 10 steps that Ray spoke about today. Also gives you a visual guide and some information to go off of after this webinar. And again, thank you very much. We appreciate your attendance and listening to us today. And if you'd like to get more information, uh, questionprocommunities.com has a lot of information there about the platform. You can always tweet us at questionpro. Also email us, communities at questionpro.com if you have any questions. And then you can see there Ray Pointer, uh, his email address, and then my email address as well. Feel free to, to email us any questions or anything that comes to mind. Again, thank you very much and have a good rest of your day or evening. Thank you.